There's a new age of drone warfare. In Ukraine and in the Red Sea and Gaza. The, the main problem that we're trying to solve here is trying to offer a cost-effective solution. I think there are a lot of people working on this problem. There are a few different ways to tackle it. Some people are, are making drones that are trying to obviate the need for like the massive two million dollar missile systems. Those are, you know, they're a lot cheaper than the missile systems. They're still like five, six figures. Right now we're maybe a hundred to a thousand times more expensive for drone shoot down compared to the cost to produce each drone. We want to get like the three to four X cost differential on our side. Laser weapons have been around 20, 25 years, something like that. Some of the first laser weapons that were out there, they had to be hooked up to the like, nuclear reactor on an aircraft carrier. They're massive. They're like 50 to $100 million each. They've gotten a lot better, but they're still like massive and very expensive. And I think they've let a lot of people down. There's been a lot of hope for directed energy over the last 20 years, and it just has not come to fruition. We really want to do is kind of deliver on that promise where we want to make something that is really lightweight, really small, um, and platform agnostic, where you can kind of hook it onto to any kind of movable, mobile vehicle or platform or drone, move it around, get your own kind of mobile point defenses. How does one get into an industry like this? Just, you don't just wake up one day and just start building lasers to shoot down drones. I started my career in heavy industrials and kind of the, the automotive and, and heavy manufacturing area, but then I moved into more like optics and semiconductor optoelectronics, uh, where I went to grad school for a was an engineer at a company called Coherent, the biggest United States laser company. So I worked in R&D there. I worked in uh, one of the systems groups doing uh, material processing, like high power continuous wave laser system development. And a lot of those technologies are used in not only cutting sheet steel on an automotive line, but also cutting the wings off of planes from 10 miles away. I would eventually go on and, and start a PhD in electro-optic, but very quickly I kind of, you know, was fascinated with the work that I had done at Coherent and what I had sold at Coherent when we were doing directed energy systems there. Without like a massive capex at the time, you couldn't really do a laser weapons company. It was like 2020, 2021. It wasn't apparent that the drone issue was a big problem. But I think post like war in Ukraine, it's very apparent what the future of warfare is going to be like, which is mass distributed autonomous systems that are all very cheap. Non-state actors can use these systems to cause a lot of damage. That opened up the opportunity where I think you can make a directed energy system that is really scaled down, is really small, is very lightweight, is very low power compared to a lot of directed energy systems out there. But it's made specifically for group one, group two UAS is at least the first product I, that, that, that we're trying to do. And so I'm like, you know, the, the main advantage of, of these drones is that they are mass distributed gold. They're so cheap, but then any like your grandma on a basement can make the series of them. And what we're making is a product that very specifically kind of hones in on that weakness, which is they are very small and they're all, they are very cheap and they're made with carbon fibers and plastics and resins that really lend themselves to being destroyed, destroyed by laser systems. Uh, we saw a very small version of this at the hackathon too, where it's like you guys had sent up in the back area of the venue that we had hosted, you had set up like a tent, we had tarps taped over tables and chairs and everything too. And you guys win the hackathon, you come in, it's the, one of the most popular projects there. What happens afterwards? How do you turn that into a business after? I think we just basically decide to make like an honest go of it where we just say, okay, we're gonna try and, and we're gonna go out and make a plan and, and go, out, go out and try and fundraise. And, and uh, you don't need that much money, I, I think uh, at the beginning, maybe like a few hundred thousand dollars. So at the time when we had been going to the hackathon, we had been in an accelerator called Founders Inc. Um, for maybe a month or two. And after that hackathon, they were like, okay, we're gonna give you a seat. We're gonna give you, not, not a seat check. We're gonna give you like an accelerator check, like a, like a very small amount of money. That allowed us to start traveling, to start going around and, and talking to people, going to conferences, finding conferences where, where BCs are at. We went to the reindustrialized conference in Detroit and a lot of investors there. It was like a heavy industrials conference. Industrials and defense kind of like come together. I think right now we're, we're, we're in like an era of an American of American dynamism where people are very into that asset class. And so thank God I did sales because you have to deal with like an insane amount of rejection. I mean, I ran and fundraised over two months. I talked to maybe 130 different VCs and various investors. Did maybe 200 calls with those 130 people. In the first month, my pitch was bad and everyone said no. But after you do like hundreds of hours, then uh, in the second month, my pitch was good. And like you just keep going and you keep dealing with getting like totally shit on. For, for a couple months and then eventually, eventually it all comes together. Um, I will say when we met Paige Craig, we sat down with him in the cafe at Reindustrialize and we had, uh, I think it was originally sent for 30 minutes and went over an hour and a half. And like four days later, we had a term sheet from him. And, and so that's kind of like when you find an investor that's like so into 
then then that really matters. And this is with all of our investors, with uh, Detroit, with, uh, Detroit Venture Partners, First In, with Founders Inc., with Six Forty Oxford, with Decisive Point. I'm curious how that conversation went too. So you you meet Paige at Reindustrialize, you, you schedule a thirty minute chat with him, you sit down, and then it just becomes so interesting that you guys go for two hours, hour and a half over. Um, like what what happens in that conversation to get an investment so fast and so soon afterwards? I think you're just very clear about what you want to do. We built it at the hackathon and put it all together at the end and shot down some drones. But it was like in duct tape together. It barely worked. It shot it like the smallest drone, the smallest, cheapest drone money can buy off Amazon from like two feet. And I go to Paige and I say, listen, like I think this is a thing. If this works, it will provide like a near zero marginal cost of shoot down. Like you pay the CapEx for the system, but your marginal expenditure is very, very low. It's like a cent per shot or five cents per shot. Like I looked at it, I think it can work. I'll put my name on it. You know, that's like, if you take responsibility like that, people really respect that where you're like, I put my name on it. I'm like, I live or die by, by, by what happens. It's my reputation, it's out there. I am very acquainted with this industry. I've worked in it in engineering and in sales. And so I think from a pre-seed point of view, that's probably as de-risked as you can get, honestly. I mean, me and my co-founder, that was it. Yeah, and you and John, your co-founder, have been childhood friends for a while, both from Michigan, Detroit area. Um, so I'm sure that's a great dynamic. Yeah, I mean, we met in a coding class when we were 14. Um, he didn't like me at first, and then he kind of came around. I don't know if it's like a Midwest thing or just like how we grew up, but like we basically made friends like high school and before. And then we have a group of like eight, nine, ten friends, and then we just friends with, they're just like our best friends, and we all hang out. And you know, I love all of them, but John and I were the ones that became like technical and came out here, and we're very into into this, and so it just just made sense. Like we had joked about making a laser gun for like two years, but like, hey, let's just let's do it. But the thing that kept us is like, I, I don't have the money personally to buy like a laser <laughs> to put a new gun. And now it's, it's going very, very well. The last interview we did, it was kind of like not that much going on in the warehouse. Um, can't really show what's actually going on here, but. Not that much going on. Um, few people, kind of like ragtag team, kind of building it out. Uh, but now it's like, I'm looking at a ton of employees. You guys have equipment laid out everywhere. Since that last interview we did in October, it's been three months and what seems like lightning uptake and what you guys- Yeah, I mean, know? I think we've gone from three to seven people in my time. Um, six engineers, one ops, BD person. Um, we have a lobbyist now. You know, we had had, we had, we had raised by them, but we wanted to be really intentional with how we spent money. And so, you know, we don't want to like waste money. It's very, it's very limited resource. And so I think we were just kind of specking out what we needed to get, what we needed to build and where we were going to go. And so um, lead times for stuff could be like 12 weeks sometimes, especially heavy industrial equipment, like the like laser system could take a very long time to come in. I think the main thing has been like iterating in our turret. We're on the sixth version of our turret right now. And then just getting our shoot down distance up. People have been let down by directed energy weapons in the past. And so the big question here is, can you do it? What's the technical risk? How are you going to answer the technical risk? And so that's like 80, 80 90% of the focus of the company right now. I think when you would come in, we were working on static shoots. So I was like moving drones, but not flying and maybe 30 meters. Now we're, we just got back from a field test and we have another field test in a couple of weeks, in, in a week and a half, um, where we need to get out in the field, do 100 meter, 250 meter shooting. Oh, basically. Um, yeah, and I think by the end of the year, we'll get to a thousand. If you mentioned you had six, people that are technical, six technical employees and one business ops kind of side. Can you kind of speak to why it's important to have a strong engineering focused culture? I'm sure it's very important in the industry that you're operating in, but just in general, why did you choose that split? How did it kind of form? And what's been the benefit of having a team that's comprised that way? I think it's about timing and it's about the core risk of your company. You know, if you were doing, if you did a SaaS company and the SaaS company was in a heavy, heavily regulated industry, right? Or it was something that was very heavily compliance based maybe. There are business models where it's like, you know, you were not doing something totally extremely technically sophisticated and a lot of it is on your your business relationships and partnership side and if you were doing a business like that maybe they would be reversed we have like one engineer and six commercial sales people that are all hunting for hunting for deals i think for us it really relates to what i was talking about earlier where we're going to raise our pre-seed and all of the questions were around the, the technical risk it's like you know people still don't, aren't, aren't totally sure if you can do it and so the only way you do that is by showing them and the show going to going to military demos showing them that it happens taking video recordings how have you been able to grow so fast? Because hiring, in my mind, four people, four very technical people working on laser drone systems in three months, it seems like a pretty a pretty sick feat to accomplish. Um, like what's been your hiring process? How have you been sourcing people? Like what are you looking for in next candidates? The person that you need for an engineer at a big company is very different from the person that you need. Like the R&D phase, but like some base technology that needs to be developed. Like there isn't necessarily a blueprint for some of this stuff. Um, and so the, 
the hiring process, I think has been, you know, we've tried everything. A lot of people like don't believe in LinkedIn. Some people just hire off of X, but you know, I, I don't think there's a reason to leave any stone unturned. One of our engineers is someone that I hired at a previous startup that I was doing and he was free and I wanted him and you know, I knew, I knew what he could do. And so we hired him. Uh, two people off LinkedIn, one person on LinkedIn that we got was from personal referral as well that kind of backed us up. And then one person on Twitter. So one of our engineers DM'd me on Twitter. He was like, hey, what are the problems that you have? And I was like, here's some dummy data. And then he like fixed like a smaller problem, but he just like did it in like a day. And I was like, all right, come in for an interview. And then we ended up hiring him. I think it's about being like, you know, dynamic. Each position we've sifted through somewhere between three and 500 resumes. I saw you posted on X a little bit ago where it's like one of my favorite parts about working at Aurelius or running Aurelius is that everyone below me is smarter than me and I can learn from everybody. Like, can you talk a little bit about what you've learned from different people that you've hired, like what areas of expertise are they a lot better at that you've been picking up on the fly? I hold my degrees in mechanical and electrical engineering. I've worked in CAD design, in part design, in thermodynamics, in optics, in simulators, in controls. I was a GSI for controls course at Berkeley and worked in controls for some time. John and I built the first, the first turrets, but then, you know, you hire someone for controls, they're better than me at controls, but I can just go hang out with them. And so like I'll sit like uh, like Eric is is, is kind of leading our controls effort right now. I'll just go sit with him and I'll just be like, okay, dude, I'm not like over your, sh I'm not like over your shoulder, like making sure you're doing whatever. You're just better than me at programming controls. And I just want to hang out and, and watch you. And you just hang out for an hour and watch. And like, you know, you, you I think at this, especially at this stage, everyone like uh, John and I, like my co-founder and I, we need, you need to have like a, an understanding of the technical development. And we still do technical development. I mean, I don't have a laser engineer right now. Uh, I'm hiring for a laser engineer. I'm hiring for a laser engineer. So I'm the only photonics person in the company. So I do all the laser work right now. That eventually what will happen is I'll hire this laser engineer. They'll be better than me at it, which is kind of sad. Um, I think the hardest part for me has been so much of my identity has been in being an engineer. And probably the hardest part for me so far has been in letting, like letting, letting go of some of that. Recruiting is is huge because like it's such a leveraged activity. If you hire a great person, it's so worth spending so much time making sure that that's the right person and that you're not hiring the wrong person. And so it's all about trying to find like high leverage activities that that you do. We were we were in the field last week doing testing and like I was out like recovering drones, flying the drones, working on the controls a bit, working on the laser system, hooking a field, like getting the electrical working and everything. What's been in the field work, you know, I'm sure it's very different testing out the laser turret in the office or in the warehouse or in the test environment versus actually doing field work. I kept seeing pictures online about, you know, you have people in the back of the U-Haul, you know, wrap, like frantically fixing things if something's going down or whatever. What's been the biggest learning of going out and doing field testing as many times as you've done it versus coming here and doing it in the test facility? Oh yeah, I need like a big piece of land because we need to field test more. We have our own interior uh, laser testing chamber. So it's like we have our warehouse and then within it, we have a long chamber that we, that, we, that we test within. That's all like sealed up and it's and everything. You get the system working in there and you're like, okay, time to go, let's go out in the field. So it's all about that that iterative, iterative development. One thing that we haven't addressed, kind of like the elephant in the room is this entire background. Um, so we're in Aurelius's uh, office right now, our test facility. Can you talk us like what what is in the background? We have the flag, the bench press, all this equipment, like, you know, I think it speaks a lot to the culture of Aurelius too. So I'm wondering if you say a few words about what all this is. You know that you're on the right track when you start to get Twitter hate. We can't show anything in the warehouse right now. So this is like our photo op area where like we, we only take recordings of videos here. Um, and so, you know, when I post pictures and stuff of the team, I post it and you get people that are like, that are like, oh, you're showing the American flag and no substance, classic San Francisco, like text scene. I just love it. I don't care. I mean, obviously we're extremely pro America. I don't think you'd work at a, an American weapons weapons company startup if you were not extremely pro America. We, we have like a whole setup here just to like make people comfortable. So like if you're just coding and your brain's breaking, then you just go and like lift a little bit and like hope, hopefully it helps. From the last time we interviewed, a lot has happened. Three to seven employees, you're going from 30 meters to 100 to 250 meters now of the turret to shoot down distance. What's next for Aurelius in 2025? What's the goal? Is there headcount goals? Is there personal goals? Is there, you know, 
range requirements? Like, what are you trying to accomplish within the next year or so? Yeah, I mean, by the end of the year, ideally not like December, but like by the end of the year, we want to have a thousand meter shoot down, repeatable shoot down, like a system that can be repeatedly produced and actually like, sent out there. Um, we want to have successful field demos. Um, we're, we're set up for a series of them this year where you go out under military observation and they kind of record this is how you perform and this is what was interesting or not. Um, we will raise again this year. We'll do a price round. And uh, from there, you know, I don't know, head count. I don't know. I couldn't tell you. It'll be more. It'll be more for sure. What's your plan to achieve the goal by the end of the year? Yeah, um, I think te technical development, it's about like getting better lasers, producing better modified laser optics housings, um, getting the control stack to work a lot better, getting the sensing stack to work a lot better, fixing the power issues. I mean, I could go like on and on. There's an inf infinite list. We've gotten a ton of outreach from like like truck uh, autonomous truck companies, autonomous ATV platform companies, boat companies, ho a housing company, um, a couple satellite startups, stuff like that, where it's like, if you can provide mobile point defense, that's huge. And if you can do it in an affordable way, then you might be doing B2B contracts, which is really, really interesting. Uh, I think an another interesting thing that I see on your website is you not only do you have the laser turret if you have enough of them kind of in like an arsenal kind of rounds or like some kind of linked chain it becomes an like an entirely autonomous threat detection and tracking system as well so not only are you shooting them all down but you have a whole arsenal of these turrets you can track detect observe you know anything that you really want to um, which i think is i think is super super sick as well so yeah we want we want them all to talk to each other we want you to be able to do coordinated fires if there are multiple drones if you're in a particularly hot sector we want it to be like cheap and modular enough that you can kind of scale up the number of these systems that that you have um we want to integrate with existing software platforms because there's no reason to, to there's no reason to gatekeep software on something like this some people want to do a play like that i have no interest in it i think that it makes a lot of sense to sell a unit that works and integrates with the existing sensor suite that you have out there and whatever information that you have out there i think that's the way to keep to keep uh you know americans safe uh, as quickly as as effectively as possible at the end of the day what we want to do is we're going to produce a system that is like like, we don't want to rip off the American taxpayer. We want to sell a hardware system. We buy it once, it works, we'll do servicing of it and everything. How do you even go about starting mass manufacturing a laser turret? When you get to a design that works really well, maybe you produce two, three, five in-house, especially with demos. You can go and ship these products like across the country. You know, we would go out with them and, and do demos, especially on these platforms, all these different vehicles. The ATVs, the boats, the trucks. And so you go out and show those. And then when you start to produce more and more units, you take a look at like the housing, right, uh, of the system. We want to do commercial off the shelf for pretty much everything that, that we can and operate somewhere between like a manufacturer and a systems integrator, I think. But like the housing, for example, we'll have to produce it. We'll get a bunch of sheet steel, sheet metal, sheet aluminum, stuff like that put that together in-house. You know, there's a playbook to do it. It's extremely difficult though. It's extremely, extremely difficult. And so basically it's kind of like fundraising. You're just bad. You just suck like when you start and then you perfect your, perfect your manufacturing. There's a lot of de-risking you can do though. And I think um, for, for future hires, that's one of the things we would do, get in, get in kind of a manufacturing expert. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's like the best way to succeed is just fail over and over again until it works. Michael, thank you again for your time. Um, it's been amazing to see the growth too. And uh, we'll um, we'll check back in in a, in a year. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. Thank you, man. Thank you.